So uh, we might as well kick off. Um, my name is Dermot Tynan. I'm joined by uh, Tom Howley. Hi, my name is Tom Howley. I'm a member of the Block Storage Service Team. Um, I've also done some work kind of uh, around common services shared across various OpenStack services, particularly working in the area of, of HA. And I'm currently working on the, the Cloud OS Core engineering team. And I'm John Tynan. I'm a cloud consulting principal for an OpenStack services group within HP Helium. Um, up until recently, I was a member of the Neutron team for HP Cloud. And before that, like Tom, I was on the uh, Cinder and Bach engineering team. So some of the stuff we're going to cover today, uh, it's got a, uh, a strong Neutron focus. But we're also going to cover how we HA the Neutron database and RabbitMQ. Uh, we're going to talk about the network nodes, the API servers, and then we're going to get into some of the issues we've come across running this at scale in production, particularly around inter-AZ clustering, uh, split brain, um, failover speed, stoneth, keep lives, cluster maintenance, and some conclusions. And I'll hand it over to Tom. Thank you very much. So, um, just to kind of give a bit of background on this. My original work on HA for OpenStack services was in the context of uh, the, in the context of the Bach project, which is a, a custom distributed scale-out block storage solution that we developed originally as a backend for a Nova volume service um, and subsequently for Cinder. And in the Bach project, we had a lot of HA requirements for a number of custom services, including a RabbitMQ instance. And at the time, I mean, this is a couple of years ago, RabbitMQ itself was quite immature in terms of the clustering and, and the mirroring of, of, of um, RabbitMQ queues. And we also got recommendations from RabbitMQ experts that you know, it wasn't a good choice at that time for a HA solution. So we decided it would be a good idea to use a kind of more traditional Linux HA stack of CarSync and Pacemaker for both our custom services and for a RabbitMQ instance. So this kind of progressed then later when we went to um, deploy our Grizzly, Grizzly in, in our public cloud, we had a requirement at that time to provide HA, RabbitMQ, and database across a number of services. And we kind of made a pragmatic decision you know, based on, on deadlines and also based on the fact that we had a lot of experience already in Pacemaker and Corusync to use the same deployment uh, methodology and the same set of deployment tooling that we had. So as a result, we, you know, it, as for you know, Nova and Lance and Cinder, for Neutron, we use Pacemaker, CarSync, DRBD stack for Neutron. So this, kind of, this diagram shows an example of how we deployed it across a number of availability zones. And you know, we'll mention the fact that we had a CarSync cluster running across three AZs, because that, that brought up some own issues of itself. Um, just to kind of briefly mention, so as most of you are probably aware, that CarSync is clustering software that provides particular guarantees around delivery of messages to upper layer applications, uh, specifically for implementing HA solutions. And you know, it provides notifications when the node has joined or left a cluster, and also will tell you when you've lost Quorum, for example. And Pacemaker sits on top of CarSync and basically manages a set of resources where a resource can be anything from you know, a process or a managed IP or a file system. And in addition to that, we have used DRBD for basic replication of, of our data stores. And in this case, in our Neutron database deployment, we have what's a very traditional deployment model um, of a pacemaker managing our, our IP, our file system, and the service itself, where the file system is mounted on our, our DRVD. And just to kind of finally mention on that, we also use the Stoneth mechanism for bringing nodes back into a, a cluster should we get a failure. So very simple scenario we have. Loss of a node in AZ1, Pacemaker fails over our service, our database, promotes our DRBD device on AZ2, and our APIs can continue to work as normal. Meanwhile, Stanit will kick in, reset our node in AZ1, and as soon as that node rejoins the cluster, it'll begin to resync our DRBD devices. So that, that's basically the, the same model we've used for our Neutron, Neutron Rabbit and Q instance. And as it turns out, it's, it's the very same deployment set of tools that we have for, for Cinder, Lance, and Nova in public cloud. So we, we happen to have separate physical deployments in this case. So I'll hand over to Durham just to discuss the rest of um, 
Butron HA. So the uh, sorry, the, the key one for um, for Neutron is the uh, are the network nodes. So um, we run multiple network nodes in each of our three AZs in each of our regions. Um, in this picture here, the six um, network nodes in the picture are all part of the same cluster. So essentially, we use Pacemaker in a clone cluster uh, rather than a um, active passive. So all members of all nodes are part of the same cluster within uh, a region. So uh, essentially, what we do then is we use a custom uh, resource agent to um, manage the the nodes themselves. Now, resource agent is a, is a pacemaker term, shouldn't be confused with L3 agent or DHCP agents. Unfortunately, it's, a, it's an overloaded term. But our resource agent checks that the, the services are running and uh, can start and stop the individual services. So what we actually do is rather than fail over an L3 agent to another system is we actually shut it down. So if we look, for example, at what Neutron sees in a typical cluster, this is a four node cluster running DHCP agents and L3 agents on each node. Um, that's the output of a neutron agent list. The numbers in parentheses there, as you can see them, are actually, um, obviously, neutron agent list doesn't list that, but that's, that's just showing a reference of, of how many networks or how many routers are on each um, agent. So essentially what happens then, when we have uh, an outage, let's say, of those four machines, if Bob dies, uh, the first thing is CarSync is going to notice the node missing uh, a token lost, reports that to Pacemaker. Pacemaker then will take corrective action, use Stoneth to immediately shoot the node, and then runs, runs our resource agent to update the uh, Neutron database. So what our script does is it moves, it first marks all of the agencies down, and then it, it takes all of the networks and uh, um, routers on that node and migrates them elsewhere. So it essentially just reschedules all of them in a round robin fashion. So at the end of that process, which is pretty quick, um, this is what Neutron um, agent list looks like. And you can see that the two, the, the two services running on Bob, which is a DHCP agent and the L3 agent, are now showed as admin state down with zero routers and networks on the node. And uh, everything has been migrated. I'm sure you didn't memorize the numbers earlier, but if you did, you'll notice that the actual workload has been um, migrated to the remaining nodes. So that's essentially how we do HA with uh, Neutron network nodes. When the uh, machine returns to the cluster, it marks its own admin status back up, uh, but we don't migrate anything back. So the workload is now distributed between the five remaining, or in this case, the three remaining nodes. and um, it will take new work because it's now available, but it w we won't actually migrate anything over. You can't force a rebalance? Um, it, it causes a slight outage to do so, and it's just not worth it. It, it, it would be nice to be able to do that, but it, it just, it's an unnecessary outage, basically. So on the API server front, um, we upstream some code to use multiple worker processes. That's in, I think, Havana. Um, we stole that code. Sorry, we developed that code using the Glance model and what Cinder uses and what Nova uses. So we kind of combined a lot of what they did. So as in from Havana, um, the API server runs in a multiple process. So I think you set worker processes to 20, which is what we use. So we have 20 processes on each node um, dealing with requests and uh, a load balancer in front. So because we have a load balancer, and I showed it fairly simplified there, it's actually a, a series of load balancers and rate limiters and so on. But um, it's a very straightforward failover in the sense that the load balancer detects the, uh, an API server is gone. It removes the, the, the entry, and then it routes all the requests to the remaining API server or servers. So what's missing here, obviously, is Stoneth. So it's up to somebody in the NOC or wherever to actually discover that the API server isn't available uh, and to either restart the service or to reboot the machine or do whatever needs to be done. And eventually, when the issue is corrected, the load balance will pick it up. So that's a much more uh, simpler, much more classic um, HA configuration for, uh, for the API. So with that, we'll talk about the, uh, what can go wrong with that. Yeah, so the rest of this talk will We'll describe some of the experiences we came across. Some of them are quite specific to pacemaker cars. I think in, in my case, some of them are a bit more specific to Neutron being used in that context. 
The first area of interest is the fact that we have a CarSync multicast cluster running across three AZs. And what I didn't mention earlier, it was the obvious thing that as well as um, you know, the, the fault tolerance that we have in losing, in losing one node, we can also lose an entire AZ in, in terms of this service and, and keep the service running. So one of the interesting problems that came up um, in one of our environments was we had some kind of network failure in our backbone between these AZs. And the failure manifested itself such that each of the three nodes in our cluster figured that all the others were offline. So we had an effect a complete partitioning of our cluster. Um, so one of the first things we did is we developed the plan for what we'd do if, if this actually happened in production, which is basically quickly get one of the nodes back up in a single node kind of standalone cluster mode and take the others out. So it was a useful, um, E even for that kind of failure on, on its own, it was useful to be able to come up with that kind of plan for, for dealing with the problem in the future. We then got to the task of actually figuring out what went wrong. Any local checks, um, you know, in terms of firewall ports, um, you know, didn't show anything. We ran TCP dump on all the nodes to see if multicast packets were, were being seen on each of the nodes, and it appeared that they could all see, all see multicast packets sent from each other. And we got networking to have a look at some switches you know, that the nodes were directly, directly attached to and also some other switches in, in the backbone. They couldn't see any error counters or anything amiss in the logs. <coughs> so what turned out was when we restarted Carsync service on one of the nodes, then we started to realize that we were actually missing packets. Because when a, when a node rejoins a cluster, it, it tends to send out larger packets and when the messaging is, you know, negotiating the, the uh, the membership, the new membership in the cluster. And these were the packets that were being lost. So it, it transpired that one of the switches in our backbone was dropping, only dropping multicast packets above a certain size. So it was passing unicast, all, unicast packets of all sizes, but only dropping multicast packets and, and silently dropping them above a certain size. So this you know, was a particularly interesting problem to come across. You know, we, d we decided that and I kind of missed out a very important point here. When, when we had a complete partitioning of our cluster, the way it was configured at the time, which is kind of the default configuration in, in Pacemaker, when you lose quorum is, is, to de is to shut down everything. So this is kind of the conservative approach. We want to absolutely ensure nothing is corrupted. So if we lose quorum in our cluster, we just shut down everything. But it turns out there are other options such as freeze, so keep it just running as it is, or even ignore, which I don't think would generally be recommended. So in this particular instance, we decided for the future that freeze seemed to make sense. And in addition to this kind of you know, new knowledge about how we should configure the cluster, we also decided it was worthwhile to add some more monitoring um, on the networking side, but even on our own local side that we could add monitoring just to check that multicast packets of a range of sizes are being you know, sent and received. And, it, this means if we do see this problem again, we can at least narrow it down uh, you know, much quicker. So the next kind of main issue that I'd like to cover is a kind of partitioning of, a, of another form, but this is specific to DRBD. I'd say about you know, a year and a half ago, the, the phrase split brain was the least, my least favorite phrase in the English language. And in DRBD, split brain specifically refers to the scenario where your two DRBD devices during some temporary loss of connectivity both try to promote themselves to master. And the obvious problem is here, you, you can get some forking of your data and ultimately you can have data corruption. So, you know, we want to avoid this at all costs. So if I just kind of take this back to our, our Neutron database setup, we lose a node in AZ1. When that node rejoins a cluster after being shot by Stonet, it begins to resynchronize our DRBD devices. What sometimes a problem occurs where Pacemaker, based on whatever resource score, uh, weighting scores have been calculated, it decides to migrate all our services, including a, a, a promotion of our DRBD device on AZ1. And because the resynchronization hasn't completed, we get this in our R log, which is basically split brain. And this is a problem. It will basically disconnect our DRBD connection and leave it at that until you manually resolve the situation. But it's very important that, we, we, that this doesn't happen in production. So luckily, Pacemaker and DRBD by a, a combination, a, me a mechanism, they 
they provided a mechanism to avoid split brain. Um, this is kind of an example of a DRBD resource file configured with what's called DRBD resource level fencing. And what's basically involved here is you have two handler scripts. One is called fence peer, which is invoked as soon as you lose um, connectivity between your DRBD devices. And the second is called when, you, when your DRBD devices have, have resynced. When we lose connectivity, so if we, if we go back to the example of where we've lost AZ1, our fence peer script will automatically add a rule to pacemaker, the pacemaker SIB. So the SIB is basically a distributed um, store of the current cluster configuration and the current cluster state. So all nodes are up, the SIB on all nodes are updated um, every time there's a new change. Um, this rule is it's slightly confusing. It's, it's a bit of a double negative. This basically says, under no circumstances, promote any device, any node that isn't AZ2 to master. And this should avoid split brain during this, this occurrence. It's kind of highlighted there. So we shouldn't get this scenario now, because until the devices have resynced, that when the devices do resync, it would actually remove that rule from our SIB, and then we're kind of back to normal. So you know, this, this all seems fine. I, I should also add that the AZ1 node itself We'll also try and invoke this rule, but there's a timeout added to our fence peer script, so that ensures it gives enough time for Stanet to kick in and basically kill that node before it does anything, anything drastic. So in theory, we shouldn't encounter split brain. But unfortunately, QA raise a bug. And there might be some people in here that recognize this. So I, I mean, I'd be quite interested to know how everybody here would reply to this bug. Um, we obviously took it seriously and did some investigation. And it, what's important here is, um, as I mentioned, there's a, a SID maintained in our pacemaker cluster that, that stores current configuration, current state. Every time there's a new change, we increment what's called the epoch. So if we go back to the same scenario where in cluster one here, where effectively our core rate cluster, we've lost AZ1 node, we've added a rule to say, don't promote any other device, ex any other node except AZ2, and that brings it up to epoch 201, say, for sake of argument. Meanwhile, the node in cluster two, um, what I've called cluster two, by some kind of quirk in the design of CarSync, when you bring down uh, a network interface, it actually rebinds to the local host and sets up a kind of a standalone cluster. I, I, apparently, this is kind of for uh, some kind of test mode operation. And unfortunately, what it typically does is it, in this standalone cluster, it typically adds a couple of um, property changes to the SIP, which brings the epoch to 202. Now, I, I should say this doesn't always happen, so it's, it's very much a timing thing because the node may be shot before it's had a chance to do this. But when the nodes reform a cluster, because it's of a higher epoch, it basically kills our rule and leaves us open to the potential of a slip brain occurring. So you know, it doesn't happen all the time. We ran a number of tests, and it both kind of real tests and other tests we can run hundreds of iterations simulating network loss. So there was a simple one where we used IP table rules to block all incoming packets, all outgoing, various combinations. Hundreds of tests run in the lab on various clusters no split brain occurrence. Similarly, we did um, disabling of ports on the switch, you know, tens, of tests, tens of these kind of tests, no split brain. Um, we also went into the lab, did some good old fashioned cable pulls, again, no split brain. When we ran the same basic test um, suite in our lab using the if down ETH, 50% of the time it resulted in split brain. And kind of based on even you know, asking questions in pacemaker mailing list and you know, searching the internet. Can anybody guess what our response to QA was? <laughs> okay, is that over to you? Yes. So uh, talking more specifically about the, um, the neutron end of things, um, I should first point out that Jack McCann has a presentation on Thursday where he goes through operating Neutron at scale. So he'll cover a lot of the more detail about the, the facts and figures of, of how we have found Neutron when you run thousands of routers, thousands of networks, and so on. So I'll give a plug for Jack's talk at 4 o'clock on Thursday. So 
our idea of scale here is, again, 1,000 to 4,000 routers. Uh, and we, we have a, a pretty large uh, sys-test environment that we run this stuff at, and, and we beat it up. Uh, and we've come up with some interesting conclusions. Um, Sudo, for example, does some interesting things. Uh, NTPD does some interesting things. Failover isn't always as fast as Pacemaker and the rest of us would like. Uh, DNS and DHCP may not do what you think. And um, something uh, we call the dreaded soft lockup, which I'll get into as well. So essentially starting with sudo, one of the things we noticed was that sudo, the out of the box sudo as delivered to us, scans the network node for all of the ethernet interfaces. Now it's probably been doing this for years uh, and maybe everybody knew that, but we didn't. So unfortunately on a network node, when you have 2000 tap devices, every time you run sudo, it has to scan through 2,000 devices. So uh, we now run a version of sudo that doesn't do that. Um, other things like NTPD also basically looks to see every time a new interface is added to see whether or not it needs to do anything with it. So all of these processes running there as we're adding network no or sorry, adding networks and routers to the L3 or to the um, network node means that they're slowing things down on the machine. So an IP net NS also uh, has to troll through these things and it doesn't do it fast way when you start to get into four digits of namespaces. And if you look at the log files for Neutron, you will see, uh, we'll, ex we'll ignore the use of the name quantum there, uh, but um, you see a lot of these IP net and S execs run as sudo. And even if it's only three to five seconds of a delay, when you're doing so many of them, it can actually um, incur quite a lot of uh, time penalty. So where that really hurts us is in terms of failover speed. So. Um, when you're adding networks and routers to, an L to a network host um, and they're taking three to eight seconds each, you don't really notice too much if you're just adding them sporadically. But when you need to fail over 2,000 onto a machine, the failover can take hours. So uh, that's not something that Pacemaker and CarSync was really designed for. They're more designed for a very, very fast failover of a virtual IP or an Apache server or whatever. But when you have that number of routers that need to be migrated across the cluster, it can take a while. Also, adding 500 routers to a machine that already has 2,000 can actually take um, less, uh, a lot longer than adding them to a, a machine that's just rebooted. So when you look at the mean time to repair of a network node, um, particularly if it's been shot by Stoneth, uh, it may come back online within 15 minutes. And some, sometimes it's actually better to just let Stoneth shoot the machine rather than try and actually do anything HA, because the machine will actually come back up quicker with its own payload than the others. So, so that pr provides us with a kind of a, a quandary as, as to whether or not we should shoot the node or whether we should uh, um, and let it reboot naturally or whether we should migrate the, the load. So uh, we've done quite a lot of work in terms of particularly um, Carl, who's in the audience here somewhere, in terms of speeding up how long it takes to recreate that workload on a different network node. Um, but it's still quite a significant amount of time. Um, another thing we noticed is that DHCP when you um, fail over DHCP from one um, network node to another, um, every now and again we get a new port assignment. Now, um, I know um, we have fixed that upstream. On a, well, we fixed it internally, and I believe it's upstream now. But the issue with that then is, is that any VM that happens to have that IP address for their DNS mask um, will no longer be able to see any DNS unless they're using their own DNS configuration until such time as they renew their lease. Now, for a variety of reasons, we run very long DHCP lease times. So you'll suddenly find that a machine can be um, quite a long time without any access to DNS because the DNS IP address has, has shifted from 10.0.0.2 to 10.0.0.3 or something. And uh, we have upstream some fixes in there, but these are the types of things that you suddenly run into. Um, and my favorite is the 22-second um, dropout. So uh, we discovered this with um, the version of the Linux kernel which we're using and when we have a large number of namespaces on the machine. So <clears throat> we have a performance group, and I should mention Rick and Mishi who did a lot of the work on this. Um, when you get 4,000 namespaces, you end up with 16 million entries in the mount hash table. Uh, and the as configured hash table has 256 entries because nobody really expects a machine to have that number of namespaces. So what ends up happening is, is that you, you end up chasing down these long chains of, of namespaces while you're holding a VFS mount lock. And the, uh, the upshot of that is you'll see this in the log file. 
Now, these things probably appear in log files uh, on all kinds of heavily loaded um, network nodes, but you don't really notice unless it so happens that that CPU happened to be running Corasync. So that CPU is out to lunch for about 30 seconds or so. Uh, Corasync, the default tuning we use for Corasync is you need to have your token within about a second. That's the out of the box tuning that we use for everything else that says Corasync needs to see a token within about a second. So uh, if you've lost it for, 32 or for 22 seconds, um, we get this, right? So Corasync reports the node is gone and we end up doing this, right? So we shoot the node because of a loss of a token within 22 seconds, and you end up with this. Now, that doesn't particularly help matters because now what we've done is we've transferred all that load to the remaining machines, and they're gonna have to work harder, right? So, the, other, the thing, this kind of, the conclusion about this really is, it's unusual for us to see actually, honest to God, really dead systems. Oh, so we end up with this kind of zombie state, both in terms of switches and in terms of machines. So the switches Tom covered when he talked about how um, the, the, the switches, the fabric could actually uh, exchange packets between the AZs, unless they happen to be Corusync packets, in which case it said, well, I'm not transferring those. So, and then you, you, you end up, you, it looks like you have network connectivity, except the only thing that doesn't is Corusync. And Corusync, as you, as you know, doesn't like that. And likewise, it's servers. Um, a 22 second dropout on a machine, a 30 second dropout on a machine isn't really going to make much difference. Maybe people don't even notice it. But once you put high availability in there, now it's an issue. So um, looking at some of the side effects, um, Pacemaker does expect things to, be, uh, to fail over pretty quickly. Uh, and if it's going to take you six hours or up to six hours to, to fail things over, you really need to know that that machine is dead before you do it. So we have pulled back on the Corusync config to see how long it, it can be before you give up on the token from the default of a second, which is what we use again with the database and MySQL and so on, or RabbitMQ. But for the network nodes, we've pushed that out to 30 seconds and beyond. Because what you have to ask yourself is, will you take a 30 second hit on a machine that's just disappeared off the network or, or take the six hour hit of, of uh, transferring. So this brings us to Stoneth, which is um, sort of an interesting area because a lot of the work within HA, particularly in Neutron, um, is, uh, is, is around alternatives to, um, to pacemaker car sync. So um, we don't really need to mention too much about what happens without quorum. We've seen this. So to Stoneth or not to Stoneth is, is an interesting question to, to misquote Shakespeare. So um, we see a lot of kind of application specific HA being rolled out, which wasn't necessarily available when we started to do this HA. So for example, Galera now, rather than MySQL on a um, DRBD cluster, RabbitMQ clustering, multiple DHCP servers, and VRRP for L3 agents, or uh, DVR, which it, in my view would be the better solution. Um, the one thing those things don't do is they don't shoot the node. Right. So what they will do is they'll address the issue of what happens if one of your network nodes goes down or if one of your database nodes goes down, but it won't actually take corrective action. So the real question is whether that's a good, or, good thing or a bad thing. So if you don't take corrective action, you need a knock team who are going to come in at 4 o'clock on a Sunday morning and, and uh, fix the machine. Um, and in the meantime, you have a cluster that isn't quite uh, ready for prime time. If something else happens, now you could have an outage. But you avoid the situation where Stoneth will just decide, I'm going to shoot that machine because I don't like it. Or as has happened in our lab environment, where we've misconfigured ILO, and you suddenly shoot the wrong machine. So uh, that kind of gives you a, a very bad Stoneth day to, uh, to realize you've just shot a compute node. So I'll pass it over to Tom to cover some stuff about Keep Labs. OK, so just to mention a, a couple of topics specific to RabbitMQ, you know, obviously relevant to our RabbitMQ, our, our Neutron RabbitMQ deployment. One issue is, is around the, the loss of connections when they're not noticed on, on a peer node. So there's a simple example here where we have an RPC server that's listening for requests on a queue on our RabbitMQ server. And then we have a client that's publishing requests to that RPC server. Say, for example, we lose our RabbitMQ server in kind of an abrupt fashion so that there's nothing sent on the wire to let the RPC server know that we've lost our TCP connection. 
So at this time, the RPC server is kind of in blissful ignorance and is happy consuming away on, on, on the queue as far as he's concerned. Meanwhile, RabbitMQ server is, is, is brought back. Um, if it's a persistent queue, it, it'll redeclare it, or, or else that queue will appear the next time a client tries to publish a message to it. But the problem here is there are now zero consumers on, on our queue, and our server will never receive them. And it will only receive them until it actually reconnects to our RabbitMQ instance. Um, it's worth pointing out here, I mean, you know, any time you generally have a problem, I think most people's approach is um, obviously how do we fix it, and also how do we add a monitor to detect this again in the future. So there's a simple case here where for some of the queues, we should never have zero consumers. Something is wrong if that happens for a certain period of time at least. So our solution to this was to use TCP Keep Alive, um, which is reasonably straightforward. Uh, the only thing is that there's slightly different ways of configuring Keep Alive, whether it is the, the server or the client side. In terms of RabbitMQ, you can only configure Keep Alive on all the TCP connections. You can't actually tune the Keep Alive settings. So for RabbitMQ server deploys, we had to tune the, the, the system-wide um, Keep Alive settings, because otherwise you would be waiting for about two hours before RabbitMQ realized the connection has gone down. On the client side, we tended to modify our RabbitMQ clients to actually tune Keep Alive settings on all their sockets. So we did this for Pika and also for PI, PYA and QPLib. And some of these changes were upst upstreamed, um, certainly at least in, in terms of enabling Keep Alive, and I'm not so sure about the actual specific tunings. So, you know, that, that works fine, um, but there is an alternative at the AMQP layer, which is to use RabbitMQ Heartbeat. Um, and again, at the time when we, when we solved this problem originally, PYA and QPLib, didn't support heartbeat. Um, but um, you know, I'd say it's just as viable a, a solution to the same problem. Another quick one on RabbitMQ, and this is particularly relevant to Neutron because of the high number of compute nodes that we tended to have in public cloud, is that this placed a heavy demand on the number of connections that we had to our RabbitMQ server. And as a result, it burned through file descriptors rapidly. And it rapidly hit the limit of the default of 1024. And our solution to this was to modify the RabbitMQ pacemaker resource agent to just be able to configure, um, you know, with a call to you limit to configure the number of file descriptors that were allowed. Uh, it was, it was, the reason we did it this way was, was, a, was because of the way RabbitMQ server actually started up the process at the time. It uses the start stop daemon. So, you know, that, that also worked fine. And we, we designed it so that it was configurable, so we, different services deploying RabbitMQ could just pass that, that file descriptor limit down into their deploy. So th the final topic I'd like to cover, which I think is a very important one, and you know, it's, 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 it probably tends to be mentioned a lot across the conference in, in various guises, is upgrade or maintenance. And you would think that you know, now that we have a nice HA solution, once we can migrate our services to more than you know, two or more nodes, you know, our upgrade solution is, is very straightforward. So as an example here, I have um, a cluster of, of 10 nodes that's grouped into five, five HA pairs. And it's, it's worth noting here that the DC of a pacemaker cluster plays a very important role, and especially in this story. So the DC is a designated coordinator, and all, all pacemaker decisions, all policy decisions, whether you start a service, stop a service, you know, shoot a node, they all go through the DC. And if a DC in a cluster is lost, Pacemaker will very quickly re-elect a new node. So, you know, that, that's not a problem. So for upgrade, we simply, you know, say for example, we take HA pair one, all we have to do is migrate services off the node, upgrade, reboot. So uh, upgrade, I'm tending to talk in terms of, you know, kernel upgrade, firmware, or even a re-image of a node. Similarly, we can migrate our services back and upgrade that node and reboot. And that's all fine. But as it turns out, in one of the scenarios that we were testing, we moved on. So we, we had re-imaged a couple of nodes and you know, upgraded them. And then we moved on to the DC just, just by chance. So we migrated services off the DC, upgraded and reboot as before. And we now have a new DC. But for some strange reason, this DC doesn't have a kind of an exact view of the cluster. It, it believes that the first half of HA pair one is no longer a member, a member of the cluster. And it was quite strange because we, we were seeing messages at the DC node saying peer is not a member of the cluster, yet the node itself figured it was still in the cluster. Um, and I should say that 
this seems to be a quirk of the, the version of Pacemaker we were running with, which was the kind of the supported release with, with Ubuntu Precise. But in any case, an interesting problem. And obviously, the real problem here is that once it, real, once it decided that the first node was no longer a member of the cluster, it decided to restart those resources on another node. And now we have the same resources running twice, which is, which is a serious problem. So one of the things we learned out of this is that in the future for doing these kind of re-image or upgrades of nodes across the cluster, a good idea is to put the whole cluster in, in maintenance mode so that your resources are no longer managed by Pacemaker. And if anything goes awry in your cluster, it won't have any negative impact. And that's assuming that your upgrade, you know, doesn't, you, don't, you don't want to have your cluster in maintenance mode for too long because obviously you've, you've lost your HA during that period. And also just to point out that you know, upgrading Pacemaker and CarSync itself, which is something we decided needed to be done when we encountered this particular problem, you know, because it was related to a particular version of Pacemaker. Upgrading Pacemaker CarSync itself is, is quite a different challenge because you have to worry about compatibility either between the versions of Pacemaker or CarSync and also between your current configuration, so your Pacemaker SIP. You may have to, you may have to upgrade that in a separate step and upgrade you know, Pacemaker separately. So I'll hand over to you, Dermot, first. Sure. Um, I'll, I'll quickly go through these because I know we're running low on time and there's probably a few questions. So um, some of the thing with high availability really is that it, it is a difficult problem. And when you start out to do something, you suddenly realize why pacemaker and car sync are just are so complicated. The more things you run into. Monitoring, as we said, is really, really essential. Uh, it is easier to just reboot the node sometimes. Um, Stoneth can be a mixed blessing. Um, Again, upgrades, careful planning. I, I think that the key word for me is, is the DVR would save a lot of grief for us in terms of how, how, how to basically avoid um, high latency failovers on, on network nodes. Now, there's always a need for a network node because of things like default SNAT, but if we can offload the network nodes so that the, uh, most of the work is done on the compute host, then high availability, particularly for the, the L3 agent, is, is a lot easier. Um, I will mention that we are hiring, like I think most places here, uh, get that plug in, and uh, I'll open it up to any questions. No questions at all. Oh, yeah, hold on. Down the back. Uh, so you noted that... Uh, all right, so you guys noted that... Um, uh, Rabbit had issues with the reconnects and you were uh, uh, using uh, TCP cable lines. Um, we've seen a, a similar example. Um, the combo support for Keepalize has been reverted because no uh, thread was implemented to uh, take care of that. Um, and um, the kernel-based Keepalize appears to not always work also. Okay. Is that something you guys have come across? I, I, certainly I, haven't. Had, I haven't seen that in, in our deployment. And we, we have used two variants of rather than cute lines with keep live. Uh, and obviously, we did some testing, but we, we haven't seen that. And have, how have you resolved that? Or? We haven't yet. So. Which? We haven't yet. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the script, you're, the script you're using for monitoring the uh, L3 agents and the NCP agent, is that available somewhere? Um, we can make it available. Um, we, didn't, we didn't upstream a lot of that stuff just because we weren't sure that anybody else had an interest. Uh, but I suspect if, if the interest is there, we'd certainly make it available, yeah. Yeah, yeah. because we have, to, have been doing something very similar. It might be interesting to you know, compare mm -hmm. the approaches. Yeah, yeah. cool. Reliability. Is there any thoughts about snooping the package and sending it to the standby and supporting TCPHA so that it's 100% uh, reliability? Sorry, I didn't catch the question. Did you, I didn't, could, you, could you repeat that, please? I don't think that thing's working, is it? Yeah, it's not working. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, regarding the reliability or high availability, are we thinking about snooping the package from uh, active to the standby? Standby being the passive. Not taking only taking the action on the sandbay, but not reacting to the action word, uh, so that uh, if active goes down, sandbay is up and ready at any point of time, and so that even the statistics uh, metering everything will be 100% perfect with the support of packet snooping and TCPHA. 
Is there any thoughts on that? Um, I think we're out of time, but we can have that conversation. And um, outside, actually, it's probably easier because I think there's another group of people who want to come in. But um, I, I think the answer is no. Tom. Yeah. Right. Cool.